If you're like me, you've read tasting notes from well-known critics and come across terms that didn't really make much sense or which seemed confusing or surprising when applied to a particular wine. I've also had some viewers ask me about some wine descriptors that I've used in my tasting notes on some of my videos. So I've assembled a list of 15 of these most common, confusing, or surprising wine descriptors, and in this video, I'm going to explain what they mean. The first confusing wine descriptor is backwards. This is a term that I would frequently see used in connection with Bordeaux. Robert Parker used it quite regularly, and it confused me. I thought, what the heck does backwards mean when you're referring to a wine? Well, backwards, and also forward, typically refer to the state of a wine's evolution. So a wine that is backwards is a wine that is less developed than you would expect compared to other wines of the same type and class and vintage. Conversely, a forward wine is a wine that has aged more rapidly than you would expect. The next confusing wine descriptor is dumb. Dumb refers to the situation where you have a wine and it's difficult to detect aromatics and flavors. But this is not a term that we'd use just for non-aromatic wines such as Pinot Grigio. Rather, it refers to a temporary dormant phase that a wine may be experiencing at the time, but which it will hopefully come out of. This oftentimes happens with Chateauneuf du Pape, which I find tends to show extremely well on release, but then after a couple years, it will shut down or go through a dumb phase from years three to seven or eight, and then after that, it will start to show well again. I've also experienced it with Bordeaux, and the winemaker for Il Poggione also told me that he thinks it happens with Brunello di Montalcino. In his view, it's best to either enjoy that on release or shortly thereafter, or not again for 10 years or so. The next wine descriptor I'll be discussing is one that's more surprising than confusing. Of course, I'm talking about cat pee. Cat pee refers to the tangy or funky aroma that you can smell in a wine that's somewhat reminiscent of cat pee. You will typically find this descriptor used in connection with Sauvignon Blanc, and in my experience, it's most properly applied to New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. While the term cat pee may seem derogatory or negative, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the wine, and it's not necessarily even a bad thing. That's just the taster's attempt to try to accurately convey what he or she is experiencing when smelling and tasting a particular wine. And certainly in the case of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I think that's a legitimate tasting descriptor. As long as we're discussing animals, I may as well discuss barnyard next. Barnyard is a term that's sometimes used when the taster perceives aromas that could include animal-type smells such as horse or perhaps even manure. These barnyard flavors and aromas can be caused by Brettanomyces. Brettanomyces, or Brett for short, is a yeast that oftentimes lives in wineries and which can cause spoilage. Some tasters actually appreciate small amounts of Brett and find that it adds complexity to red wine. But certainly at high levels, Brett can be a fault and it can overpower the fruity aromas and flavors that are supposed to be present in a particular wine. One of the most common use cases that I found for the barnyard descriptor is Chateauneuf du Pape, especially Chateauneuf du Pape from a traditional producer that has large old barrels that have been used for many years. Sometimes the best way to describe something is by explaining what the opposite is, and so it is with a confusing wine descriptor angular. The opposite of angular is smooth. So the term angular is used to refer to a wine that could be lean and sharp. Oftentimes I found this is used because the wine may have excessive acidity relative to the other characteristics in the wine. Tension is the next confusing wine descriptor. Tension refers to the situation where there's two opposing characteristics that create sort of a dynamic energy in a wine. An example would include a German Riesling, such as a Spätlese. With a Spätlese, you're going to have high acidity, but you're also going to have pronounced sweetness. These competing characteristics can combine to make the wine seem very alive and certainly contribute pronounced flavor intensity. It's almost as if there's a battle going on in your mouth. This is certainly generally a positive descriptor, and it's one that I definitely appreciate in a wine. Flabby is the next confusing wine descriptor. This is a term to refer to a wine that is lacking in acidity, so it's the opposite of an angular wine. 
Oftentimes the term flabby is used for a red wine that's high in alcohol by volume and full-bodied, but which is low in acid. There's no doubt that the term flabby is a negative descriptor. It's a term that could be used to describe an unbalanced red Zinfandel or perhaps a Grenache. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. If your wine is matterized, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, unless it's Madeira, it's definitely a bad thing. Matterized wine is wine that has had exposure to heat and potentially oxygen in a way that was harmful to the wine. The result will be a wine that's excessively jammy or perhaps has excessive flavors and aromas of dried fruit. It means that the wine is flawed and is probably not worth drinking. Oxidation sometimes goes part and parcel with heat damage because exposure to excessive heat can cause the wine's cork to lift, which can allow oxygen to enter. So of course, to prevent this, it's important to store your wines properly. Austere is the next confusing wine descriptor. A wine that is austere is one that is somewhat lacking in fruit, especially relative to the structure or tannins in the wine. It's a wine that would be the opposite of a wine that is opulent or flamboyant, for example. Examples of austere wines can include Bordeaux from structured vintages such as 1986, 1995, or perhaps even 2005. That's a vintage which, although it was highly acclaimed, I still found many of the wines to have structure in tannin that overpowers the fruit to some extent. This is a term that generally has a somewhat negative connotation. At best, it means that the wine could require additional time before it improves and becomes more balanced. The next confusing wine descriptor is one that many people get quite worked up about. I'm referring to minerality. And under the subheading of minerality, you might also find additionally confusing descriptors, such as whetstone, chalk, or flint. Many people decry the use of these terms because they say that there's no scientific evidence to show that the soils in which grapevines are grown contribute this sort of a characteristic to a wine. Wines that may feature flavors and aromas of whetstone, chalk, flint, or minerality include German Riesling, Priorat, Chablis, Champagne, and wines from the Loire Valley. While I don't have any scientific evidence to support the link, I do note that many of those regions are those which have rocky soils. And for those who really are adamant that the soil has no impact on the flavors and aromas of a wine, Try wine from a volcanic soil, such as Etna Rosso. The wine descriptor linear is potentially doubly confusing because it has at least two meanings. So it's important to consider the context when trying to figure out what the critic meant when he or she used that term. The first potential meaning refers to a wine that is straightforward or simple, such as a Pinot Grigio. This could be a wine that's lacking in flavors and aromas and is somewhat non-aromatic, but I've also seen the term linear used to apply to high-end wines. In this situation, the critic could be referring to a wine that the person believes to have flavors that arrive in smooth procession and which has adequate structure. Hmm. With respect to a red wine, a wine that is round could be a wine that is smooth with tannins that are not too grippy or prominent. I think where I disagree with some people is I don't think that the term round when applied to a red wine refers to a wine with low tannins. Rather, I think that the term refers more to the nature of the tannins. So for example, you could have a wine with high tannins, but those tannins are polished or smooth, such that the wine is still round. An example could be a wine such as Cloapalta from the Colchagua Valley in Chile. That is a blend of Bordeaux varietals that can have medium high to high tannins, but those tannins are typically soft and velvety and so it's definitely a wine that could still be described as round. In contrast, a wine from Italy made from Sangiovese, particularly a young one, could have very grippy tannins. So you definitely would not use the term round to describe that wine. With respect to white wines, I oftentimes use the term round to apply to white burgundy, like a Chasson Montrachet. This could be distinguishable from a Chardonnay like Chablis, which is a little bit more angular due to the higher acidity. The next confusing wine descriptor is focus. What is a focused wine? Well, it would be the opposite of muddled. 
So it's a wine that has clearly delineated flavors and aromas. If you have a wine that lacks focus, you may be able to detect that there's red fruit generally, but not identify any particular type of red fruit. In contrast, with a focused wine, you could tell that there was red cherry, strawberry, raspberry, and so forth. The descriptor focus is definitely a positive. This is so because one sign that a wine is complex is the ability to identify numerous discrete descriptors. So the more descriptors that you're able to identify, the better the wine may be. Yeah. And while it is a positive for a wine to be focused, it would be even better if the wine were precise. And so precision is my next confusing wine descriptor. The descriptor precise is extremely favorable. It means that every single aspect of the wine is what it should be. Everything is in perfect harmony, and it's quite complex. You're able to readily identify numerous discrete descriptors. An example includes high-end champagne. For example, it's a term that I frequently use when I'm giving a tasting note for a Cru Grand Cuvée. Another descriptor that I've received some questions about is the term mouthfeel. That refers to how the wine feels in your mouth. Is it sweet? Is it dry? Is it velvety? Is it coarse? One example could be a Chardonnay that is described as creamy. The Chardonnay could be creamy because it may have underwent malolactic fermentation, where they converted the tart malic acid into the softer lactic acid. So that's one example of mouthfeel.